I were to pick the most important element of health and safety management, it would definitely be risk assessment. They help us identify what hazards in the workplace may harm us and help us develop a plan on how we protect people from those hazards. This plan will help us figure out more or less every element of our health and safety management system, including what equipment we should use, what training we need to provide and what needs to be in our policies. The good news is that you do risk assessment every single day. It's an essential part of being alive and staying that way. When you cross the road, you look left and right to check no cars are going to hit you before you cross. When you're having a brew, you check that it's not too hot and maybe give it a blow before you drink it. When you see someone walking towards the thermostat, you jump up and stop them to protect your wallet. As a human being, you're constantly looking for hazards and looking for ways to avoid them from causing you harm. You are essentially completing a risk assessment each time you do this. And being at work is no different. You're exposed to things that can cause you harm all of the time whilst you're working. And just like in your day to day, these need to be identified and controlled to reduce the risk of causing you harm. The difference is, whilst you're at work, assessing risk goes beyond self-preservation and becomes a legal requirement. And that's for a great reason. When you're at work, you are put in a situation where you are exposed to hazards that you wouldn't usually be exposed to in normal life. And as such, your employer has a duty of care to protect you from those hazards. So, in the workplace, we can't just look around and use our common sense to avoid hazards. Employers must hit a selection of legal requirements that we need to hit, and in order to do that, we need to take a structured approach to carrying out risk assessments. The HSC recommends that we follow five steps to risk assessment. One, identifying the hazards. Wherever you work, whatever you do for a job, there will be hazards which could harm your health, safety and well-being if uncontrolled. Some hazards are obvious. We know that the knife is sharp, we know that if we walk near a big drop it's dangerous and we know that if we get hit by a fork truck it will hurt. However, some hazards are not so obvious. As humans, we're pretty good at identifying hazards and avoiding them. However, there are many, many things that we simply can't detect with our naked caveman eyeballs. Things like radiation, diseases and asbestos simply can't be seen, heard, smelt or felt. And generally, we only realise that we've been exposed when the negative effects kick in. However, these hazards can cause injury just as debilitating as fatal as a knife, a fall or being struck by an item of plant. So in order to keep everyone safe at work, we can't just identify the obvious hazards. We have to identify all the hazards that we encounter at work and how they can cause harm so appropriate measures can be put in place. And in order to identify all of these hazards, we need to take a structured approach. But before we start on our hazard identification journey, we need to do a bit of housekeeping. First off, we need a clear definition of what a hazard is. A hazard is anything that has the potential to cause damage to people, plant or property. Basically, anything that has the potential to cause an accident or ill health. This is in contrast to risk, which is the combination of likelihood of the hazard causing a negative effect and the severity of an accident if the hazard was to cause the negative effect. The word hazard and risk are used a bit interchangeably in everyday life, but when we are doing a risk assessment, it's important to make the distinction between the two words. The second, much more important piece of housekeeping is the fact you can't identify hazards from your office. You need to go to the area where the work will be done and you need to speak to the people who are going to be involved in the task. The people doing the work will have a much better idea of what hazards are associated with the task and will also know in detail how they envision the task will be completed. So their input is essential. Okay, so you're at the point of work with the people who are going to be carrying out the job. Now we need to take a systematic approach to identifying the hazards and to do this we firstly have to identify all the factors involved in the task that have hazards associated with them. These factors can be broken down into four categories. People and process. These are the people who are going to be involved or may be affected by the task you are planning to undertake. Within your list of people, you will have the person carrying out the work, however there will also be other people who may be affected. These could be other workers in the area, contractors, visitors to site or members of the public, or even trespassers who shouldn't really be there. 
Also, think about the process the people will be working to and how the tasks will be carried out. Equipment. Next, think about what equipment will be required for the task. Most tasks require quite a bit of equipment in order to complete the task. Even the task as mundane as boiling an egg requires a pan, a hob, some sort of egg retrieval tool and a timer. Each piece of equipment will have its own set of risks, so it's important that we identify all of the equipment required for the task. Next up, what materials are you using for the task? Most tasks require materials which will transform into the finished product or be required to provide your service. Whether you're a builder with bricks and mortar or a cleaner with an army of cleaning fluids, materials will be required to do your job. Just like equipment, each type of material you use will have a selection of hazards associated with it. So listing the materials involved will assist you later in identifying all the hazards associated with them. Finally, look at the environment where the task is going to be carried out. Will it be carried out indoors or outdoors? On a busy high street or in a quiet office? High up or underground? By defining where the work will be conducted, we will identify hazards at the next stage associated with the environment of the task, as well as environmental factors that may exaggerate the risk profile of hazards derived from tools, equipment, materials or people. By grouping elements of the task into people and processes, equipment, materials and environmental categories, it will help you identify hazards associated with each part of the process. You can remember the categories through the acronym PME. Now, each of the items that you have listed going through these categories are not hazards on their own, but they will likely have hazards associated with them, which could cause you harm. And as mentioned earlier, some of these will be obvious and some will be hazards that are harder to spot. For example, if you have identified that one of the pieces of equipment you will need is a circular saw, there are the obvious hazards of cutting yourself on the blade. However, there will also be a range of other hazards such as noise, vibration and dust associated with that tool too. So for each item that we have listed through going through the PME, we need a systematic approach to identifying all the hazards and so we need to look at six categorizations of hazards. These are physical, biological, chemical, environmental, organizational and mechanical. And you can remember this through the acronym PERBRICATION. I can do better than that. BOMPEC? Nope. CHEMBOM. Ugh, close enough. So, let's take a look at each of these categories individually. CHEMICAL. Many processes at work use chemicals and harmful substances. Machines and plant have oils, lubricants and fuels required to run them. If you're building a structure, you will be using cements, adhesive, sealants, paints. Even general office work requires chemicals for cleaning, printer inks, etc. as part of the normal duties. Many chemicals in the workplace are harmful to health and can cause nasty burns, irritation and even conditions such as asthma. In addition, there are also safety hazards such as increased risk of fire and explosions. So step one. Take a look at the process and see what hazardous substances are going to be required and make a list. Environmental. These are the hazards associated with where the work is going to take place. So if you're working outside, the weather presents a range of hazards. In cold weather, you have hazards such as frostbite and the increased risk of slips and trips. Whereas in hot weather, you will have hazards such as heat stroke and sunburn. Similarly, high winds can present hazards when working at high and with vehicle movements. Heavy rain can reduce visibility and lead to sludgy ground which can cause slip and trip hazards. Depending on where you are working and whatever time of year you are doing the task, weather hazards will be different so bear in mind this when you are doing your assessment. Not all work takes place outside, so weather is not always an issue. However, environmental hazards can also come into play in an indoor working environment. Environmental hazards such as noise, lighting and the temperature of the environment can also prevent hazards which need to be controlled too. Mechanical. These are hazards that are caused by the operation of a machine or tool, such as contact with moving parts. Generally, machines don't stop for people. If you get hit by a tractor, it is going to do far more damage to you than you are to it. 
The same applies for tools. If you try and stop a drill spinning at 2000 RPM with your bare hand, it isn't going to end too well, is it? Similarly, it won't be stopped by your hair or clothes either and will start to draw you into the machine instead, which sounds like a horrendous way to get injured. Mechanical hazards also includes things being ejected from the machine. Swarf ejects from a drill or sparks from a grinding disc can result in a range of stabbing and puncture wounds. Mechanical hazards are generally at the, at the higher end of the risk scale, so definitely don't miss these particularly if you're looking at hazards associated with the equipment you're using. Biological. This includes any nasty bacteria, viruses or other pathogens that you might be exposed to during the task. You will likely find these when you are looking at tasks that involve cleaning, handling a waste, working with poorly people or working with animals. Within this category, I would also think about things like animal bites. So if you're in a profession that works with animals such as vets, a postman or an employer eye safe with four dogs running around a small office, then look at these hazard categories very carefully. Organisational. Next up are the organisational hazards. These are the hazards which arise from the way we run our businesses and particularly the way people behave as a result of our management decisions. Time pressures, shift durations and overtime are a big issue here as they can lead to people cutting corners and making mistakes. Similarly, ineffective supervision can lead to the same corner cutting and mistakes being made. The relationships with other people is also an organisational hazard. Internally we can have hazards such as bullying, inequality in our workloads. Externally, we can see hazards such as violence and abuse, particularly when dealing with members of the public. Ultimately, it is the organisational hazards that are the primary cause of mental health issues such as stress and depression, which are becoming more significant and more prevalent in the health and safety statistics, particularly when it comes to absence rates. So look at these carefully and be critical of your own organisation when trying to identify hazards in this category physical. Finally we have the physical hazards and it's time to pull out our GCSE physics textbooks now because many of the things we studied in physics can cause us harm in the workplace. Gravity leads to trips, falls from high and falling objects which can land on people. Newton clearly didn't do his hazard identification when the apple hit him did he? Adding lack of friction to gravity and you get a slip hazard. Many of the ergonomic risk factors such as force and lighting come under the category of physical hazards too. So consider hazards such as manual handling and the use of display screen equipment in this category. Also consider things like vibration and noise produced from your actions that people may be exposed to during the task. Radiation isn't present in every workplace, however some machines, particularly ones used for imaging, use radiation. But radiation is one of the three methods in which fire can spread, along with conduction convection. So consider your fire hazards in with this category too. And speaking of conduction, consider your electrical hazards here too. If we look at these six categories for each aspect we are identified in the PME stage, then we stand a good chance of identifying all the hazards involved in a task and how they can harm us. To hammer the process home, let's do an example and try to identify all the hazards associated with a task. Let's say we're working at the car wash washing cars. Car nope, we already did that with button bop, stop it. Let's start with looking at PME. So the process is a car drives in, it's blasted with a pressure washer to get the thick of the dirt off, cleaning fluids are applied to the car using a sponge, then we blast it off with a pressure washer again, and the car goes to be waxed and polished. We then take payment and the car drives away. The people involved are going to be you, your colleagues, the people who are having their car washed, members of the public in general, including, in this case, there may be young, pregnant or vulnerable people. The equipment that is going to be used is your pressure washer and assortment of brushes, sponges, cloths. The materials are going to be cleaning products and waxes, etc. And the environment is going to be outside and there is going to be a significant amount of vehicle movement. So within this, we've got quite a lot of things that we need to look at the hazards for. 
However, to avoid this video becoming three hours long, I'm just gonna pick one, the use of a pressure washer. So let's look at Kembo. Stop, just stop. Chemicals. At some point in the process, we're going to have to blast off the cleaning products using the pressure washer. So there are hazards in the form of the chemicals getting onto our skin, into our eyes, as well as inhaling and ingesting the substance through splashback and water mist. Exposure, particularly the long-term exposure to chemicals you would see in this activity, could lead to a range of illnesses and skin conditions. So this is definitely a hazard we need to control. Environmental. We're going to be using the pressure washer outside in all weathers and the fact that the pressure washer sprays water is going to be a hazard here as the chances are whoever is going to be using the pressure washer is going to get wet. If the weather is minus two and you're spending the day in wet clothes this can produce hazards such as hyperthermia and poor circulation to your extremities. Add in hazards like vibration which we'll talk about in a moment and you're increasing the risk of conditions such as vibration white finger. In addition, you are going to be using the item of electrical equipment in wet conditions. Now, a pressure washer is going to be IP rated, so water will not interact with the electricity within the equipment. However, the extension cable, which may be used to power the pressure washer, may not be IP rated, and that needs to be considered with as electrical hazards. Mechanical. Hopefully the cars have stopped when you do it in this job, otherwise you have some major mechanical hazards here. However, the pressure washer itself has mechanical hazards too. The equipment will have pumps with moving parts, which if unguarded, may cause a mechanical hazard. Now, hopefully all the casing is intact and the moving parts are properly guarded. However, we will need to check this is the case prior to use. The main mechanical hazard, however, is the fact that we are ejecting high pressure water. Have you ever accidentally caught a part of your body when using a pressure washer? Spoiler alert, it bloody hurts. Therefore, we have a hazard of making contact with the water the pressure washer is in use. Not just for the person using it, but also for other people in the area. Biological. This is similar to our chemical hazard. Again, we're blasting dirty cars with high pressure water and there'll likely be an element of splashback. The dirt on the cars could harbour a number of nasty pathogens from the road dirt, animal poo, particularly pigeon poo, dead insects, etc. When we're blasting this off the car, it could splash back and get on our skin, in our eyes, in our mouth, and the dirt contained in the atomised water could be inhaled. Exposure to these can make whoever is in the area, particularly the user of the pressure washer, ill. Organisational. The pressure washer is a key part of the process and is required at two critical steps in the car washing process. This means that if a person uses the washer is slow, it holds up other workers. This introduces time pressures on the user, particularly if other staff members are waiting around or other customers are in the queue waiting around pipping their horns. This could lead to the operator to rush and cut corners, which can lead to the operator error as well as stress. Finally, we've got the physical hazards. We've touched on a couple of areas such as vibration and electricity, however we also have noise levels and ergonomic issues too. So we've identified the hazards associated with the use of the pressure washer and I'm pretty confident we've identified all the hazards here. Now we need to repeat the process for all the other elements of the task identified in our PME. At this point you may be thinking this seems like a long-winded approach and to be blunt, it does take time to identify all the hazards associated with the task. But be honest, would you have identified all the hazards associated with the task of using a pressure washer without following the process? I'm looking at you, biological hazards. If you think you would have, feel free to argue with me in the comments below. Hopefully you will see the benefit of effective hazard identification, however we still have a lot more to do to build an effective risk assessment and next up we need to evaluate the risk of each hazard. 2. Assessing the risk. Water is great, particularly since we need it to, you know, live. However, water can also be a serious hazard to us. It can scold us, drown us, make us slip, harbour diseases which can make us ill and generally hurt us in many, many ways. 
However, the level of risk is dependent on the circumstances. A puddle is nowhere near as dangerous as Niagara Falls. They are both the same hazard, good old H2O, but present wildly different risks. And we see this all the time in the workplace with a range of different hazards. You could be using a ladder to get access to a light bulb that needs changing, or you could be using a ladder to get access to a 53 meter high chimney. In both scenarios, you are working at height. However, the risk is drastically different. Similarly, you could be using electricity to charge your phone or using electricity to power your factory. Again, the hazard is electricity, however, the risk is very different. In these examples, I'm sure you've assessed these scenarios and identified that one has a higher risk than the other. And so, well done, you've evaluated the risk. However, just eyeballing a situation and deciding what is risky and what isn't isn't the best way of evaluating risk and it may lead you to spend excessive time, money and effort on control measures or, more sinisterly, not do enough to control the risk of a hazard. The law says that as an employer we have to ensure, as far as is reasonably practicable, the health, safety and welfare at work of our employees. In brief, the term reasonably practicable means we have to put measures in place which protect our employees within the realms of good sensibility. It would not be reasonably practicable to spend tens of thousands of pounds to protect against paper cuts in an office. However, it may be reasonably practicable to spend that money on guarding a machine that could kill someone. So by properly evaluating the risk, we can determine which hazards need more of attention and which need less. In addition, people's perception of risk can sometimes sway the opinion of what is high risk and what isn't. A guy clanging in a window in a skyscraper is used to that level of risk. However, the people working in the skyscraper probably think he's crazy. So we need a structured, standardised approach to how we evaluate the risk involved in a task to account for people's perception of risk. And to do this, we need to look at two things. Firstly, we need to look at the likelihood or probability of the hazard causing us harm. As an example of this, let's look at everyone's favourite viral disease, COVID. If you're travelling to work in your own car, the chances of you getting COVID are pretty low. Whereas, if you're on public transport with umpteen other people, the likelihood of catching COVID is much higher. We can assign a number to show the likelihood. The lower the number, the lower the likelihood. The second thing to consider is the potential severity of the outcome if the hazard was to cause infection. If you're a young healthy person with no underlying health conditions, COVID may knock you off your feet for a day or two. However, if you're an older person with many underlying health conditions, infection could be much more severe. Again, we can assign a number to these to show the severity. The lower the number, the lower the severity. To determine the risk, we multiply the numbers we've assigned to likelihood and severity. So, a young person driving to work in their own car would have a likelihood of catching COVID of 1 and a potential severity for catching COVID as 1. So, we multiply 1 by 1, which is 1. Whereas, an older person with underlying health conditions taking the bus would have a higher likelihood of contracting COVID of 2 and a higher potential severity of 2. So, we multiply 2 by 2, which is 4. By doing this, not only can we see that one situation is riskier than another, we can also have a measurable value for risk. In reality, measuring likelihood between 1 and 2 does not give us a wide enough range to determine risk, so instead we measure on a scale between 1 and 5. On a tangent, some businesses increase this range to between 1 and 10, particularly in super regulated industries such as aerospace, however for most businesses between 1 and 5 is fine. So, for likelihood, we look at how likely it is for an incident each time we encounter that hazard, with a value of 1 being very unlikely and a value of 5 being very likely to happen. With severity, it ranges from 1 being negligible injuries to 5 being potential death or life-changing injuries. By ranking likelihood and severity between 1 and 5, we end up with a risk level of between 1 and 25. 
If you get a risk between zero and three, it's considered low risk, and it means that we don't have to apply any further control measures. If you get a risk between four and nine, it's considered medium risk activity. In this case, you should look at the control measures which are already in place and see if any improvements can be made to bring that risk level down. If you get a risk between 10 and 19, you need to start adding some control measures because your activity is now classed as high risk. And if the risk comes out at 20 or higher, you need to stop work until you have applied significant control measures to the task. So if you do this for each hazard in the workplace, you will find where you need to apply further control measures and which ones you just need to keep an eye on. Three, controlling the risk. Doing a risk assessment without putting control measures in place is a bit like giving Anne Frank a drum kit for her birthday. It's pointless, dangerous, and everyone will think you're a twat. However, unlike giving someone an ill-considered gift, not doing something about the hazards that you've identified through your risk assessment will leave you in breach of health and safety law and will likely lead to you being called negligent by someone in a wig as they hand you a big fine or a prison sentence. But Picking control measures is not quite as simple as just choosing some things that maybe may help keep people safe. And as with anything in health and safety, there are processes we must follow and laws we must abide by. So let's go through how we pick our control measures and keep people safe. However, before we start, can you help me control the risk of me actually having to do some actual work by hitting the subscribe button below? When applying control measures, we must legally follow something called the principles of prevention, which are outlined in the Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations. The best way I can demonstrate the principles of prevention is to work through an example. So imagine I need to go and do some work on the motorway. Now, a main hazard with working on a motorway is being struck by a moving vehicle. So if I walk into the middle of the motorway without any control measures, I'm going to have a bad time. Using our risk evaluation from the previous video, the likelihood of me being hit by a vehicle is almost guaranteed, so we can rate the likelihood as a 5. The severity of me being hit by a vehicle and travelling at 70 miles an hour is pretty much certain death, so again, the severity is the highest level of 5. This means the risk rating is 25, the highest it can be, so we definitely need to put some corrective actions in place. So, according to the principles of prevention, the first thing we need to try and do is eliminate the hazard entirely. And in our roadworks example, this is totally possible. We could just shut down the section of the motorway while I'm working and divert the traffic through the towns around me. Problem solved. We've eliminated the hazard and now there's absolutely no risk of me being hit by a car. And all it took was making thousands of people late for work and ruining the whole economy. Obviously, this isn't a practical solution in this case. However, in many cases, it is possible to eliminate the hazards from our places of work. Take window cleaners as an example. Back in the day, they used to climb up a ladder to clean your windows, which presented a fall from high hazard. Nowadays, they use a pole to clean your windows from ground level, and the fall from high hazard has been eliminated. They do a sh job, but at least you won't get caught in your drawers or end up with a severely injured window cleaner in your garden. Other examples include using conveyor belts to eliminate the need for manual handling and using a tile cutter instead of a grinder to eliminate dust and noise along with countless other hazards. One thing you should know is that eliminating one hazard often brings other hazards. So if you use a conveyor belt instead of manual handling, you're introducing hazards such as electricity and moving machinery. If you are introducing hazards that pose a greater risk than the hazard you're eliminating, you may want to reconsider. Okay, so we can't eliminate the risk entirely from our roadways example. So we go to the next section of the principles of prevention, which is substitution. Substitution measures replace the hazard with a different hazard of a lower risk or find a compromise in your elimination measure to make them more practical. In our roadworks example, we can't replace the hazard as I'm pretty sure that sponge cars haven't been invented yet. However, we can reach a compromise and shut just one lane of the motorway instead of the whole thing, meaning I'm isolated from the traffic but there's less disruption to everyone else. Other examples of substitution measures include 
swapping out that fine lead-based paint for solvent-based paint, or better yet, water-based paint. You won't get that sweet, sweet lead-based taste, but you will be safer. Sticking on the subject of painting, you could change the method of application. If you're spraying paint, you could increase the risk of inhaling, ingesting, or getting paint in your eyes or on your skin. Whereas the chances are much lower if you use a brush or a roller to apply the paint. Thinking about tools, chainsaws are ridiculously dangerous. One thing that often causes injuries is they have a tendency to kick back and hit you. However, you could use a reciprocating saw instead as you won't get cut your kickback with these and they're generally much safer. Substitution measures are great, but without additional measures, things could still go wrong. So I've shut down the lane of the road, but without any signage, actually, cars will still come into the lane where I'm working and hit me. So next on the principle of prevention, we need to consider engineering controls. These provide a physical barrier between you and the hazard. In our case, we can put a full concrete barrier around the lane where I'm working to isolate me from the traffic. We see engineering controls a lot in the workplace, from guarding around moving parts of machinery, to handrails around stairs, to welding screens, local exhaust ventilation, dust suppression. The list is endless and includes anything that acts as a physical barrier to stop you interacting with or being harmed by a hazard. However, we still need to do more because we still haven't notified people about our lane closure. There is a concrete barrier in the middle of the motorway, which isn't ideal for our road users. So next, we look at our administrative controls. These are the rules that we set out, our checks and methods of monitoring, and generally the information instruction and training we give to people that may be affected by the hazard. In our roadworks example, we would put signage in place to let people know a lane is closed. We would also lower the speed limit to 50 miles per hour, and we would put cameras in place to enforce that speed limit. At work, we have things like policies, procedures, safe systems of working to communicate rules and expectations to keep people safe. We also provide training to employees so they know how to work safely and provide things like inductions, toolbox talks, notice boards and signage to reinforce this training. We also have documentation like checklists and permits that add additional layers of control. The eagle-eyed among you may have started to think at this point that the controls seem to be getting a lot easier to defeat. It's pretty easy to go over the speed limit and there's nothing physically stopping you from doing that. Similarly, there's nothing to stop you from deviating from a safe system of work or completing a checklist. A rule is much easier to break than a solid concrete barrier. This is why as part of the admin controls, we have to put monitoring measures in place. In our roadways example, this will be putting average speed cameras to deter people from breaking the speed limit. In the workplace, we monitor through audits and inspections. These still aren't flawless. Things can be missed on audits and inspections, so issues can fall through the cracks. However, admin controls are still very important and are crucial to determining legal compliance if the HSE come a-knocking. But next, we come to the weakest control of all, Good old PPE. Personal protective equipment really is our last resort. However, for the novice risk assessor, it seems to be the go-to, and this is a common mistake when people write risk assessments. The problem with PPE is that if a hazard is close enough that it can be stopped by PPE, it is too close. Think about it, if I take away all of the control measures that we've put in place, the closing the lane, the barriers, the signage, and waddle out into the middle of the road wearing a high vis, I'm still going to get mowed over. I'm not knocking PPE, it definitely has its place, but it's considered a last resort. Okay, so I have my control measures in place, let's take a look at how that's affected the risk. So, from a likelihood point of view, we've drastically reduced the chances of me being hit by a car. I'm almost entirely isolated from the traffic and beyond someone defeating the barrier through an act of amazing automotive acrobatics, I am not gonna be hit by a car. So, we can lower the likelihood from a five to a one. From a severity point of view, we have lowered the speed limit from 70 to 50 miles an hour, so we could argue that there might be a slight reduction in severity. However, I would say that being hit by a lorry at 50 miles an hour would probably still kill me, so this remains a severity of 5. 
On a side note, a lot of people believe you can't reduce severity. However, this is just one of those myths around risk assessment, which we busted in our five risk assessment myths video. Take a look at that up there. So through putting corrective actions in place, we've reduced the risk from a very high level of 25 to a much lower medium rating of five, which is a much more acceptable level of risk. Okay, so we've gone through the principles of prevention, but there's one last thing to bear in mind when you're putting corrective actions in place. Collective controls, i.e. controls that protect multiple people, are always better than individual control measures. Let's say you have three people working on a flat roof. The individual controls would be that they all wear harnesses, meaning that they would all need harness training, all the harnesses would need to be inspected and checked before use, etc. Not to mention the fact that they are frankly going to get tangled up at some point and are going to be clipping and unclipping at points, meaning that they may be unprotected. The collective measure, however, is putting a temporary handrail around the roof, which would make work significantly easier and would offer more protection to the individuals doing the work. Next up on our risk assessment journey is the recording, reviewing and communication of risk assessment. 4. Record your findings and communicate them to the people doing the work. Legally, if you have five or more people working within your business, you have to document any significant findings of your risk assessment, including the hazards involved in the task, who may be harmed and how, and what you are doing to control the risk. So by this point in your risk assessment journey, you're probably left with about 100 tables which look something like this. And this is likely something you've seen before at some point in your career. A big old stack of risk assessments that you're expected to read and sign. Now, I want you to be totally honest here and hit the dislike button if you've ever actually sat and read a full suite of risk assessments for a task word for word. I want to point out at this stage that anyone who's clicked the dislike button is a liar because nobody has. The key is in how the legislation is worded. You have to document the significant findings. Your risk assessment currently documents every hazard and every countermeasure from paper cuts through to work at high. Not all of these findings are significant and it's basically information overload for anybody who's going to read it. Risk assessments aren't really for people to read. They're a management tool to identify and control hazards to keep people safe, particularly the significant hazards we encounter through our work. Although they are part of our communication strategy and you should get operatives to acknowledge them and sign them to prove your legal compliance, you should also make sure communication of the significant hazards and controls is better than giving someone a stack of paper. The main way to do this is by providing them with a safe system of work along with the risk assessments. Safe systems of work are sometimes referred to as method statements or safe operating procedures. However, they are essentially a step-by-step -step guide on how to complete a task safely, as well as define a sequence of operations for completing the task. It should also integrate controls identified from the risk assessment into the sequence. For example, a sequence of operations for driving a car from a purely operational perspective may go something like this. Open a door, enter the vehicle and close the door, put the key in the ignition, press the clutch and turn the key, put the car into gear, remove the handbrake, press the accelerator pedal and drive away, etc. However, a safe system of work would integrate control measures from the risk assessment, so it may look something like this. Complete a daily vehicle check, including checks on fluid levels and tyre pressures. Open the door and enter the vehicle and close the door. Put on your seat belt, put the key in the ignition, press the clutch and turn the key. Put the car into gear, check your surroundings to ensure that there are no vehicles, pedestrians or other obstructions. Use the indicator to notify people of your direction of travel, remove the handbrake, press the accelerator and drive away, etc. This is a relatively basic example, however, hopefully you will see how to integrate controls of significant hazards, in this case collisions caused by accidental operation or mechanical failure, and much better communicate using a safe system aware than in the risk assessment itself. Development and communication of safe systems of work are a legal requirement, so this is something that we absolutely have to do. 
However, there are other ways to communicate significant hazards in addition to the safe system at work, including inductions, toolbox talks, safety briefings and notice boards. By using a range of communication methods, you're likely to ensure the control measures are implemented effectively and are effective in stopping hazards from harming people. Ultimately, your risk assessment is a plan of how you will carry out the work safely. And as we all know, plans don't always go well to plan. Your risk assessment may appear fantastic on paper. However, in practice, control measures you have put in place may not be as effective as your assessment may suggest. Tens of thousands of accidents happen every year which are reportable to the HSE under RIDOR. In short, RIDOR reportable accidents are at the more severe end of the accident spectrum and include nasty things like broken bones, hospitalisation for more than 24 hours, penetration of the eye and scalping. Now, although I haven't gone through every single reportable accident in writing this script, I would assume that a large portion of the 61,000 riddle reportable injuries outlined in the HSE's 2021-2022 reporting period had risk assessments associated with the tasks and thus had applied control measures to keep people safe. However, as is clear from the fact that these accidents happened, these controls failed and thus the risk assessment was not suitable or sufficient. By considering and applying control measures in the order specified in the principles of prevention, you are off to a good start in applying the most effective control measures possible and your risk assessment will be more effective by using that tool. However, that doesn't mean that the controls can never be defeated by the hazard and it certainly doesn't mean that there isn't or never will be scope for improvement. This is particularly true when our assessments are relying on controls which are lower down the hierarchy of controls, such as administrative and PPE controls. Rules can be broken, processes can be ignored, shortcuts can be taken and PPE can be removed. In addition, a workplace is an ever-changing place. We update our procedures, tools and materials regularly to improve the quality of our products and services and the efficiency in which we can provide these to our customers. It is easy to overlook the fact that changes can introduce hazards which are not recognised or controlled by our risk assessments. Therefore, it's essential to review our risk assessments. So here are three ways you can monitor and maintain effective risk assessments for your business. Monitoring the effectiveness of control measures during audits. A main purpose of doing an audit is to ensure that administrative controls and processes are being followed effectively at the point of work. A big part of this is making sure that people are completing paperwork associated with the task during an audit. Completing documentation such as pre-use checks on equipment, point of work, hazard assessments and permits can make a huge difference in keeping people safe as long as they are completed by the people who are carrying out the task. During audits and safety inspections, take a look at how the task is being carried out and check that it's being carried out in accordance with the safe system of work. If it isn't, ask the people doing the job why. At the start of this absolute saga of risk assessment content, I spoke about the importance of keeping people involved when you're putting together risk assessments. If the control measures that you put in place are not workable or practical, people will take shortcuts, which often lead to incidents. By identifying controls that don't work, we can replace them with controls that do work, and this will help to lower the risk. Listen to people. Make sure that if someone reports an issue, whether it be a safety concern, a near miss or an accident, no matter how minor it is, this is followed up and is reflected in your risk assessment. Any concerns, particularly where there has been an incident, is an indicator that your risk assessment is not suitable and sufficient and the controls have not worked. If an issue is raised, your risk assessment should be the first port of call in addressing the issues and you should review this and add additional controls where required. Periodic reviews. As time goes by things change. This goes for legal requirements as well as technological advancements. In a year's time the law may have changed and you may be required to do things that you're not currently expected to do. Similarly control measures that may seem out of reach may be readily available and cost effective in a year's time. All risk assessments should be reviewed at least annually to make sure that they're kept up to date and to ensure that you're doing everything that you should be doing to protect your staff and maintain the legal compliance for your business. 
In addition, the task itself will change over time and with change comes different hazards and different controls required to manage the risk. You should ensure that whenever a task changes, you complete a full review of your risk assessment to ensure that it remains compliant. <sighs> so, I'm sure you're all devastated to hear that this is the end of our epic soiree into the world of risk assessment. At least for a little while. However, if you like keeping up to date with the world of health and safety and watching practical videos on how to manage safety within your business, why not subscribe to our channel? Or, as always, if you really can't be bothered to do your own health and safety, why not give the team at iSafe a call and we'll come out and do your health and safety for you. At iSafe, we can help you meet every legal requirement and defeat any tricky health and safety problem, whether it involves your risk assessments or anything else. So, if you're interested, click the link in the description below to get started. But for now, thanks for watching and stay safe out there. Christ, thank God that's over.